I think everyone's already on mute, so that's great. Okay. So we wanted to begin this morning um, with prayer, and I chose a, um, a parent's prayer, but we're all catechists and teachers and parents, because um, I thought it was appropriate for children preparing for sacraments, which is our um, focus today. So if everyone wants to take a little bit of a deep breath and recall that we're in the holy presence of God, And this morning we pray. Loving God, you are the giver of all we possess, the source of all our blessings. We thank and praise you. Thank you for the gift of our children. May they come to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. May your Holy Spirit help them to grow in faith, hope, and love, so that they may know peace, truth, and goodness. May their ears hear your voice. May their eyes see your presence in all things. May their lips proclaim your word. May their hearts be your dwelling place. May their hands do works of charity. And may their feet walk in the way of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, and again, I second Sister Celeste in welcoming everyone to our session today. As we said, it's, going to, it's both for catechists and school principals. Um, because over time, Celeste and I, after a lot of discussions and with the schools department, have seen that we seem to be on different pages and there's some really good practices out there and there's also some really scary things happening out there when coordinating between a parish and a school. So what we wanted to do with the um, invitation of the schools department is to have a meeting with all the principals and all the catechists and faith formation directors to say, let's make sure we're all saying the same message. Let's make sure we're all hearing the same thing and let's go forward with these best practices. Um, so what we'll talk about today are the different sacraments we prepare our children for, um, the best practices in doing those things. Um, we'll have time for questions. That's what we're really gonna focus on, let you guys ask questions. Um, and if you have issues, then, like I said, going forward, we'll all have heard the same thing and what we're doing. By the way, none of this is new stuff. It's not like we're making up policy or, or anything like that. This is how it's supposed to be done and how the Archbishop would like it to be done in the diocese. And we just like, need to make sure that everyone has heard the same message. I guess we should technically introduce ourselves. Probably, yes. Just, you know, in case there's someone there who doesn't know us. Um, I am Laura Bertoni. I'm the director of worship for the Archdiocese. So I handle the celebration and ritual side of things. And I'm Sister Celeste Arbuckle. I'm the director of faith formation. And uh, with Annalita, who's on, um, we coordinate the catechetical side and connection with parents and guardians and sponsors. So um, you were sent the handout and it was sent this morning. So if you didn't download it, it's okay. We're going to show it this morning, but you have that because we're not going to cover everything today that needs to be covered, but at least you have um, point by point what we're looking at as far as high points to celebrating the sacraments. And you will find that some of those points are duplicates throughout the sacraments because it's consistent with how we celebrate with our children and how we prepare children and youth for those sacraments. So you think we're ready? I think we're good. Are you all ready? Let's go then. So um, as the cover page says, we're going to go through the four um, areas, three sacraments and then three sacraments in one, which is RCIA. Um, so we'll start with first, we're doing this chronologically, um, not necessarily always true, but we'll start with first reconciliation because um, the majority, that's usually the first thing that we're preparing our children for um, at, uh, within schools and within faith formation at the same time. So one thing you're, you're going to hear, see this a lot, and you're going to see it on the slide, slides again and again and again. Um, and again, we're not reading these slides to you. That's not very fun. Um, but first reconciliation is a joint effort between the school and the parish. And I would add in obviously parents. So um, you're gonna see these again, these themes are gonna come up again and again and again. There needs to be a program for preparation for several years, two minimum. So this needs to start early and be 
moving through so that it's not just a short um, process. Meetings with parents and guardians need to be joint between those who are doing parish faith formation and those who are doing school. So it's not that you have a school's parent meeting and a faith formation parent meeting, they are joint. If you need to have several sessions to accommodate different schedules, that's great, but it should just be a parents of those preparing for first reconciliation meeting and all are welcome to join in and hear the same thing from everyone. Um, that also applies to celebrations. The celebrations of all these sacraments are integrated between school children and faith formation children. Um, there is no such thing as, well, now we're doing First Communion or First Reconciliation for the school kids. Oh, and then next weekend is Faith Formation kids. They need to be integrated and mixed. Um, and it actually it brings a great deal of um, diversity and um, intermingling of the parish. These are things that are we want to do, that it's not just kind of in isolated bubbles, that they need to be together. And then finally, um, something we always will emphasize, and you see all these other points too, um, Age appropriate is always really important. So we talk here that an act of contrition in the language the children understands, age appropriate program materials, that sort of thing. And that will vary. That will vary by child. That will ver vary necessarily by school or, or community. Um, but we need to make those adjustments. And again, with all of you experts, both in faith formation and principles, you know what's appropriate. You know what works for your um, schools and your parents. So therefore, use what is the best material for you as approved by the Archdiocese. So you may say, well, why do we have to engage parents in meetings? Well, from my experience, we need to get parents on the same page as our students. And in doing so, we often find out that parents are lacking in the information they need to carry out the promises they made when this child was baptized, which means to be um, a guardian of the faith and passing that on to their children. So when you gather parents and guardians together as parents uh, meetings, one of the things that I think is really important is that we talk about what sin is and conversion and why we celebrate the sacrament of reconciliation. Why do we do that? Because parents forming need to be the example for their children. They also are the ones required to prepare or to ascertain the readiness of the child for the sacrament of reconciliation. So if they don't know how to look at readiness, then they can't help you with this. And lastly, I want to say that as I go about doing these sacramental meetings with parents, and Laura and I both do these, we're welcome to come to your parish and help you with this. So often I'll ask, when was the last time that you as a parent heard your child say, please forgive me? And there's silence in the room because so often they're not used to saying, please forgive me. But this is one of the areas of readiness for the sacrament that they really look up to their parents and they need to see this as an example for them. And from the general directory down at the bottom of the page, this childhood religious awakening which takes place in the family is irreplaceable. It is the family that catechizes. So, how do I know if the child's ready? Well, first of all, they have to have a prayer life. Are they taking time to pray? What does it look like? Can they, do they know right from wrong? Do they put it in their words instead of their parents' words or their teacher's words? And I love it when children say, I want to tell Jesus I'm sorry. And lastly, I'll point out that it's really important that a simple act of contrition be learned and learned in a language that's used at home. We may all speak English, but somebody may speak Chinese, uh, Mandarin at home. 
and maybe that's the language that's prayed at home they should learn that that prayer in that language so that they can participate in the family experience of forgiveness we're ready so the celebration of First Reconciliation, um, we're used to these, and, and you guys have done these. Uh, hopefully a lot of what we're saying is nothing new to any of you, and you're saying, yeah, yeah, this is what we're doing. But, you know, again, we want everyone to hear the same thing. Um, it needs to be a communal celebration with then individual confession. We do not have general absolution, especially for First Reconciliation. Um, so a communal celebration, something where we do break open the word, there can be music, there can be any sort of, you know, communal um, awareness and putting ourselves in the presence of God, and then individual confession for the um, children. Now, this, given all of our safe environment, we need to have that set up correctly so that the, you have stations which are visible where the um, priest and the um, child is visible, but you guys know how to set those up and you can have a large space and have them in different corners or, or things like that so that there is privacy yet at the same time we're uh, meeting the charter. Um, the parents should go and receive the sacrament as well. I mean, again, as Celeste was saying, they are models. And if they see mom going or dad going or their, you know, their guardian going, that will show, first of all, this is a good thing. It's something you do all your life. Um, it's not scary. There's nothing, you know, the priest isn't going to do anything to you um, or be mean to you. I think that's very important. And so, we do have to account for that because if you're thinking, all right, I have 20 kids and I have, you know, an hour and I have two priests, you know, but please incorporate some of the parents and really encourage them to also show that modeling and go forward and, and, and um, be that model to their children. Um, we don't give a, a sacramental certificate. There's no records that need to be maintained, anything like that, but it does need to be done before first um, communion first um, Eucharist. That is something we expect to see. And enough time between so that they don't think that, you know, they have to go to um, reconciliation immediately before receiving communion every single time. Um, it can be a couple of weeks before. Um, and again, we would encourage that you not just have one big celebration, but have several different ones so that, again, mixing school and faith formation and homeschool um, children, put them all together and um, give people different times to go um, based on different schedules. I think your priests would also appreciate it um, because they don't always want to come, you know, same time for one big long marathon session. Um, it makes it a little bit easier if it's broken up and it makes it more intimate so that people aren't waiting for a long time, that they really feel that this is something that was valuable and, and good for the whole family to attend. You know, one of the things I was thinking of too, when we look at communal celebrations, especially first time for children, it's always good. Part of catechetical principle is that you show them how it's going to be set up. They get to practice some. Um, but the other thing is you should show them where confessions normally happen within the parish church so that they know what that looks like too because it probably doesn't look the same as how you're going to set it up for first reconciliation. So just so their familiarity is important uh, to uh, making them feel comfortable even after the first reconciliation as they yearn to say to Jesus, please forgive me. Now we're going to stop the screen sharing for a moment have you all back on our side so we can see you. And um, I wonder if there are any questions that need to be or things that we were not clear about that you would like us to answer. And you can just unmute yourself. I think Helena has her hand raised. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Good morning, Sister and Laura. Nice to see you. Um, I just had two questions. So you mentioned the importance of um, mixing the groups. Um, and I know for First Communion, um, it always happens on a Saturday. And I was told that some years we mix the Sunday school program and the um, St. Patrick's school kids and some years we do it separate. It depends on how large of a group it is. Um, I don't know that that anyone's realized they're supposed to be mixed, but um, I don't think it'd be a problem to mix it because it's always on a Saturday anyway. But I was told that for the first reconciliation, um, the St. Patrick's kids have it during the school day. 
um, whereas our CFF program has it on a Saturday. So um, I don't know if that's a longstanding tradition to do it during the school day or what, but um, if that's the case, I obviously can't have my CFF kids leave school, but should I be really um, telling the, the second grade teacher that they really can't be doing it during the school day? It's not a matter of saying you can't do it. I mean, yeah. it, integrating it, I mean, I, obviously it's easy. The kids are there, they, they can do it. The thing that that misses out on is I doubt they're inviting the parents. So it just becomes yeah. almost like another, oh, we're going, you know, another part of class. And that's yeah. not what this is. This is obviously a parish event. It's a sacrament. Um, so I would certainly have that discussion with her. And maybe mm -hmm. what you can do to start off is to give the option to say, you know, we we're going to have our celebration for faith formation mm -hmm. on Saturday. Could a, some of the school kids maybe join that one? Like you said, yeah. it's very hard to get the faith formation kids to come during the day to the school, but maybe some of the school kids, it would be more convenient or the parents would like to bring them to your celebration, you know, the celebration on the, on the weekend. So that starts that integration. Um, okay. But it's def definitely a conversation to have. And like I said, I would discourage it from being just another period, like, you know, well today, in, you know, we're going to go to confession. Um, yeah, yeah. It makes it too um, part of curriculum rather than part of our sacramental and parish prayer life. So that conversation could definitely be had. Okay. And then my second question is you mentioned like maybe offering different days or times just so it's not like a marathon of a day. Right. Um, I know last year because of COVID, um, they had restrictions on, you know, being indoors and how many families were indoors. And so what they did was, um, you know, they had these like little time slots and the families would sign up and they would say, oh, I'm coming at 10, I'm coming at 10.30, I'm coming at 11. Um, and that was really because of COVID. And I think that's the first time they ever did that. But, um, you know, uh, I, Monsignor was saying that in a way the families liked it because then they didn't have to like stay for three hours, you know, they could go for their appointment and then they were kind of, you know, I guess free to go. But um, so it sounded like there was some sense of maybe we should do that again this year. But if we were to do that again, I mean, would you say that it's important that uh, we're all together at the beginning for some kind of um, group? I, I know during the, we're gonna explain everything during the parent meetings, but um, if we do enough preparation before the reconciliation, is it okay that people are kind of showing up for their scheduled time or is it, is it important that everybody's together at the beginning for some kind of, you know, welcoming or prayer before we go into the um, individual appointments? That's a great question. And um, I think it's a hybrid. So no, you don't have to get every, everybody together, you know, at 10 o'clock and have a big joint thing and, and then people come back at two. <laughs> um, yeah. But so if you had little spots, if you said, okay, we're doing slots from 10 to 1045, that would be one mini one. And yes, at 10 o'clock, you do a five minute little mini service, you know, okay. just again, to get people in the presence, to get people understanding it. And then, and so you would need to repeat that little mini service four or five times throughout the day with, at each um, kind of appointment group. Um, okay. Because again, we don't want to give the impression, although sometimes this is true, that you're making an appointment, you show up, you do it and you leave. Um, we want to have some sort of communal aspect, some sort of acknowledgement that we're all here for the same reason. We're here with the family, we're here with the parish, um, and then go forward. And that it can be brief. It doesn't have to be elaborate, um, but something to, to kind of get that focus down. Um, and then, yeah, I agree. I mean, we've done it before and we all know this in communal celebrations during Advent and Lent and things like that. And then you're there for hours because there's not enough priests or something. I think breaking it up is great and people would appreciate that because it doesn't, seems so onerous and it's not taking up your whole day. And we know how busy all the kids are nowadays. So we want to accommodate that. Well, and the other thing I think, uh, which we, I know I didn't think of it a lot, was age appropriateness of children. Uh, just look at how long they can manage being in one spot doing one thing. And then I've been to, I run reconciliation services with my kids for first reconciliation and it's been an hour or two hours and God forbid, you know, I, I hate to say it, but they were running all over the place and, you know, and some parents left with kids because they didn't want to stay any longer because they thought it was over with. So, um, it's good to be aware that those little bodies uh, can't tolerate a couple of hours of ceremony. 
Yeah. Neither can us big bodies, can we? Are there other questions? Let's see, Liz, you got your hand up. Hi, good morning. Um, nice to see everybody again. Um, so this might be a silly question, but uh, the two years of reconciliation, that's not like two years plus two years for Eucharist, right? Like it's all inclusive. Okay. They'd be running concurrently. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. No, that's a great question. We didn't just like that. Yeah. 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 Good idea. Uh, we have time for one more. If there is one more, if there is, you can unmute yourself. If not, we're going to look at uh, first Eucharist. So we're running concurrent. We're okay. So, like we said, in, like Laura had said when she did joint efforts for First, Recon first Reconciliation, uh, joint efforts for First Communion. Parents need to be educated. They need to know what Eucharist is about. They need to encourage blessings and celebrations around meals. And, know, and important is stressing that they need to bring their children to church. You know, when we talk about a, a two-year preparation, it doesn't mean I never go to church. Mass is a really, Sunday Eucharist is a really important part, and to encourage parents and understand that is good. The other piece I wanted to put in, because this sometimes doesn't get understood, the catechists who are teaching classes need to be fully initiated, meaning they need to have received baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. You cannot teach what you're not practicing yourself. And also, those catechists need to be going to church on Sunday too and celebrating the, the Eucharist together. Um, Take-home materials need to be given so that activities are done as family groups together and that parents get solid catechetical information regarding what needs to be understood around Eucharist. So readiness for the sacrament, active regular life of prayer, same thing as reconciliation, participation in the Sunday liturgies, and an understanding at their level, what real presence is, is important. And I want to say a true desire to want to receive Jesus in Holy Communion. If the desire isn't there, they shouldn't be receiving the sacrament. And this is why we go back to having parents and catechists and pastoral staffs determine the readiness of the child for the sacrament. This is not a group, I finished my cla my 24 classes, now everybody's going to receive the Eucharist. They may not be ready to do that. Now the celebration of um, First Eucharist, and we've already had a, you know, kind of morphing into these questions about it. Um, first of all, the preparation. Obviously, the child must be baptized in the Roman Rite. Um, I had a hypothetical question the other day from a principal who said, hypothetically, what would happen if a child who was never baptized did first Eucharist? It's amazing how many hypothetical questions I get that, of course, never happened. They're just asking for a friend. Um, and I said, well, that's, you know, he said, that's why we ask you to get the certificates. So both in the school setting and in the faith formation setting, we do need to get those certificates. Um, we have people also who are baptized in another Christian community who now they might be going um, becoming Catholic or, or, you know, the Catholic parent is taking them. We need to know that. We need to work through it and, and figure out what sacraments they need and what processes we need to um, flow through. Just with all sacraments, this is done in a parish setting. It is the parish community. It's the parish register. So um, it needs to be done at a parish liturgy um, and a communal celebration. Again, it's not a private thing. It's not just we're just doing it for the family. You know, this is a school, first record, first communion, this is that. It needs to be mixed. We've had best practices, I think, when I hear from different parishes, um, and for all, all of you guys out there, is when, again, very much like Helena was just saying, 
we set up several different options. Um, one parish that I know does every mass on a certain weekend is going to be first communion mass, first Eucharist mass. The 5.30 on Saturday night, the 7.30 a.m., the 9, the 11, all of them. And parents sign up, both school parents and faith formation parents, sign up for the ones hopefully that they normally attend. If they're a family that normally gets up early and goes to the 7.30 a.m. mass, that's the, where the child should be receiving their first Eucharist. So they sign up for it. What I actually, um, I said to the, the catechist and the um, uh, principal, how has that worked out? And they said, it's amazing. They couldn't plan it better. It actually, just by kind of natural selection, it's been a mix between faith formation and school. It's been different people have chosen different times. It's not like all 50 people chose, um, you know, the same mass or anything like that. And it makes it a lot easier. It doesn't drag the mass on longer because we have, suddenly have this long thing to happen. And it becomes much more um, organic. So that's just part of the liturgy. Um, we do know, and we're fully aware, and you guys have to deal with this much more than we do, um, about all the trappings that go with First Eucharist. Um, the dress, the, the little suit, the outfits, you know, the, the, the veils, the, you know, we want candles. the pictures, we want the candles, you Sponsors. know. Yeah, all that. Um, you all know how those go. You know the ritual. It's First Eucharist. It should just, I mean, if I had my druthers, they would just be sitting with their families and they would go up and it would be their First Eucharist along with mom, dad, or whoever else was there. That doesn't always happen. It's fine to have the little kids up front. It's fine to have them, um, you know, have a highlight in the, when they receive their First Eucharist. Um, but it's not too big a deal. They can't be mini brides, let's put it that way. Um, and it should not be caught up more in the pictures and the, um, the ceremony than it is about receiving the First Eucharist. We also say that the parish um, celebrates for those receiving the sacrament. This is true for all sacraments, by the way. It's always that we provide for those who will be receiving the sacraments. Um, therefore, it's not appropriate to have the children do the readings. It's not appropriate to have the children if you wanted a family with one of the children to bring up the gifts back when we go do gift processions, um, that would be nice, but it's not supposed to be about the kids doing it. No, isn't this cute? No, it's the parish. Maybe some parents would like to do the readings and you could arrange that. Um, or the teachers, the catechists, the teacher from the school, but it should be the parish ministering to these children who can enjoy and don't have to worry about reading in front of grandma or getting nervous or anything like that. They should just sit back and enjoy their day and be able to do it. Of course, this gets registered um, in the in the sacramental record. They receive certificates, um, and everything you know is done again in the parish. Now, there's always the thing about what if a child hasn't been baptized, and I'm going to baptize them. Um, can I then have them join first uh, Eucharist? We'll talk about RCA at the end, um, but the answer is if a child is over seven, and they need to be baptized or brought into the Catholic Church, then they must at that time. At that time, when they are either baptized or brought into the faith, they are then have confirmation and they have their first Eucharist. Now, this doesn't mean that they can't enjoy and celebrate with their school group or their faith formation group and the parish. They can still do that. It just means their first Eucharist might have been a month ago or at Easter, and now they're celebrating with the family. But we'll talk about that when we talk about our CIA as well. So let's uh, come back as a group and see if there are questions regarding Eucharist. And uh, you can just unmute yourself. And you know, one thing I should have said also is, um, we should have said this at the beginning. I'm assuming that all of you, and we're talking to mostly catechists right now, but we'll be talking to the principals. I assume that all of you are on a first name, chummy basis with your second grade teachers of the school, your first and second grade teachers, and also anyone who, if they're doing confirmation, if they're older, you know, the seventh and eighth grade teachers. Um, you're having coffee on a regular basis. You're chatting. You're having meetings in which you're planning these events together. Um, again, also with, if you have a liturgy, a director of liturgy or someone who does the services, they need to be pulled into these for these large communal celebrations. That's just an assumption. And if you don't know their name, if you don't feel like you're meeting them and emailing them on a regular basis and saying, hey, this is really great. What dates are we gonna choose? How are we gonna do this? Let's do that. Let's start getting to know each other, pay for a cup of coffee, go out and kind of plan together. Uh, because I think that's going to be the best um, way. And like I said, we're going to be saying that we're saying this to you. We're saying it to the principals. We're saying it to the teachers. Let's keep this a group effort. 
And I know in, I've heard from some of you all that over and above just the classroom preparation that you do um, a retreat for the candidates for the sacrament, whichever sacrament we're working with, not just Eucharist. And that's a good way that also the candidates get to meet each other and share together because they are one faith community. And what a great opportunity to do that. I, we're going to talk in confirmation about service activities. There's no reason why at First Eucharist you can't do a service project together. Um, school, religious ed, homeschool people, where maybe um, you collect food for St. Vincent de Paul, or you do, you do something that um, contributes to the goodness of other people, uh, maybe uh, making welcome placemats for your seniors or cards to take to them to emphasize the sacrament they're getting ready for. So, shall we see if there are questions? Looks like we have a few. Oh, okay. Uh, I think Stephanie has her hand. Stephanie Stanko. Hi, Sister Celeste and Laura. Thank you. This is a really fantastic meeting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My question is regarding the children doing the readings. Um, knowing our community and knowing how much um, families enjoy seeing their children at the AMBO, could you send around kind of some uh, verbiage or some um, archbishop um, literature, for lack of a better word, to kind of support that perspective that we are ministering to the children and that children should be you know, we should be ministering to them during the actual mass aspect. I think that would certainly help our community and perhaps some others as well. Thank That's you. a great idea. Absolutely. And I have that verbiage because we've been distributing it for confirmation. Not that everyone pays attention to my instructions. Um, but yes, I, and we can send that out directly to you guys, highlighting it, that this is, you know, here's how we can explain it. And there's other ways, like I said, we can incorporate the children. I'm not saying, you know, they can, we can have them in there. But it's just not appropriate for them to be reading, especially since they're not fully initiated. They shouldn't be reading. Um, right. And and again, we minister to them. I always say also, you know, like I don't allow brides and grooms to do readings at their own weddings. You know, you, and if we said that, people would think, yeah, that's really weird. Well, of course. So then why are we letting children read at their con at their confirmation or read at their first Eucharist? But yes, we will send out that verbiage, kind of the policy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I realize as we're going along, um, some people may have taken a breath hearing something and you're still holding your breath because you're saying, well, that's not what I'm doing. And now they're telling us we're supposed to be doing something else. There is always the high goal and work toward that. Not everything needs to be changed this year, but some of those pieces about joint celebration and parent meetings. Those are the kinds of things, and fully initiated catechists are the high points, the salient points. We should, if we're not doing that now, we should really start doing that this year. And then you can work on moving up the ladder. Uh, let's see, Lucy has her hand up. Hi, Lucy. Hey, sister. Hi, Laura. Um, the question, I don't have a Catholic school in the parish, but we've got a couple of Catholic schools that are not connected to parishes and in our neighborhood. And those schools, um, I don't know if it was just like last year because of the pandemic, you know, but they're celebrating these sacraments of initiation at the school. And I've seen a few um, these forms that come through the parish said, Father, will you please give permission? And of course, Father just signs everything, so he doesn't care. But I also don't know where those records are being kept. They're not coming back to me to put in the books. So um, I guess I'm wondering about those school situations, the ones that are not parish schools, but they're Catholic schools and they're celebrating these sacraments together. Well, and, and they are supposed to be connected to a parish. So you're I, and you're saying things, Celeste and I are nodding our heads because we've heard these stories too. Um, and, they're kind of, and so um, 
they're still supposed to have a relationship with a parish for that exact reason, so that their sacraments get registered, so that they do have some sort of chaplaincy and faith connection, so that they know who to call when they do need you know, that connection. Um, that's a great conversation. I think that's a conversation that the pastor, the principal, and you need to sit down and say, hey guys, we need to make sure that all our, we're crossing all our T's and dolling out our I's, because nothing's gonna be worse than in another you know, 15 years when one of those kids wants to get married, and they say, oh, well, I was, you know, I had my first Eucharist at, you know, St. You know, X school and no one can find any register and no one can find any proof of it. And we're, you know, we're scrambling and, and things like that. So um, absolutely have that conversation. They, like I said, they should be connected. And if you are the parish of record for that group, then you need to be connected and, and be talking to the teacher and all of that. And yes, I certainly hope it is only because of the pandemic that they were doing the sacraments at the school, because again, it is in a parish setting, it is in a parish church. And that is not, that is a policy the archbishop is absolutely, that's not something that we can wait on. It needs to take place in a church. We, okay. we do masses, all that stuff in a church, in a parish setting. That's, that's non-negotiable. And a, a lot of this conversation uh, developed two years ago when Laura and I met with all of the priests at one of their annual priest meetings. And we did talk about these things with them. So um, it, it, they understand, or at least they've heard, that this is a, a priority of the Archbishop to go forth. Um, I know that sometimes even with people celebrating sacraments and it's not just schools sometimes it's just a family um, they'll not even ask the priest you know after Sunday Mass they come up and say oh thank you Father my child made First Communion today yeah. duh they did <laughs> and no record no information no catechesis around it you so, know part of, and I have to interrupt yeah. part of that is also um other faith communities allow that. You know, we have a lot of people who come up and say, well, why can't I receive communion? If I'm at a Methodist church, they let Catholics receive. Why can't Catholic, you know, vice versa. So some of it, if, if one of the parents is not Catholic, they think that that's absolutely acceptable. That, you know, it, a child, when they decide to do it, they go up and they're good to go. So they don't necessarily know our restrictions and our rules. Um, but yeah, it does happen. And it's kind of like, uh oh, now what? Yeah. I think we have time for one more. If we don't get all your questions, put it in the chat box. We'll make sure we get back to you. But Robin, your hand is up. Yeah, and I have Lucy's question triggered a whole thing. So I think Lucy and and myself and the two of you need to chat because I have the same issue. We can do that. <laughs> but um, the uh, last the last slides on reconciliation and eucharist you had a line in there um about separated or divorced parents both need to give permission and i understand that and i do work toward that my question is is um what is considered uh i don't want to say proof but is a verbal there you know do i need to speak to both parents or you know how does that work so we don't end up with you know we've all been burned on this 20 years ago i didn't know my child was making first communion after you two years of dealing with the family so um we do we have to have something in writing which i don't want to add to any list i mean anybody's workload but is a verbal thing okay if i make a note or what's the rule on that or is there one the rule is that anybody who has custody of the child needs to give permission for the sacrament. And that's any of the sacraments we're receiving. So, uh, yes, you do need to talk to those who have custody of the child. And sadly, even if they're in a sacramental class, and both parents have custody and one does not give permission that child can't receive the sacrament it needs to have, we need to begin the conversation yes um, so what i would say robin if you've spoken to both parents and they both said oh yeah absolutely i know it you know great i'll we'll both be there i'm bringing my mother-in-law you know the whole bit then just make a note of that and, and so that you say yes i have checked with both what we're really seeing is that 
like you said, you don't want to get burned. You want to say, I have spoken to both. And of course, if someone objects, that's the main thing. We just can't say, oh, I never spoke to the husband. I never had a chance to. And then later we find out he had a strong objection because, you know, he never wanted the child to be Christian in the first place, that sort of thing. So um, some sort of record that you keep so that you know you have checked on both sides of, of um, you know, figured it out um, would be helpful for your records should anything happen later. Um, but the main thing is we need to make sure that both, if there's multiple, there could even be more than two, um, that those involved with the custody of the child have approved it or are aware of it and don't have objections. How about we put it that way? <laughs> Maybe they don't yeah. approve, but they don't, you know, they're not going to kick up a fuss. And we all know we probably, most of us have experienced those times for coming to sacrament, whether it's first Eucharist, confirmation, whatever, where uh, parents show up, but they're divorced or they're not living together. And the, um, complications that it causes who sits with the child where does one be and the kinds of arguments that happen in at the eucharist because they don't agree so it, it's a sticky wiki that we need to continue working our, our pat our best pastoral care insights with these families but thank you um, let me go on, and, but put in the chat if you have other questions, we'll get back to you on this. On to confirmation. Yes. So, joint effort, it's the same. We need, it's a two year process of being part of the faith life of the community. Uh, it's a time in which uh, students acknowledge their, their wanting to be part of the church community, that uh, parents receive materials that they can do at home with students, the understanding that materials need to be age appropriate and in this diocese uh, confirmation, according to the Archbishop, is 8th grade and older. Materials for 8th graders isn't the same appropriate as for 10th graders. So to just be aware of that, and I just want to point out specifically service projects, which our confirmation handbook talks about acts of justice. It's important that some projects be group projects and some projects be individual. Um, you know, people say, well, how many hours does it need to be? That's a decision of the parish. But the most important part of it is that there is some theological reflection to integrate what the service is in relationship to Catholic life and experience with Jesus. So, and that's in the confirmation handbook. You can look at that and go forth with how to do that appropriately within your parish community. And again, a great opportunity for mixing faith formation with school. Um, that we, you know, the teacher and the catechist yeah. choose some projects that can be done and, you know, sign up times and then whatever families want to participate, we mix them together and they get to know each other better and, and work together on that. Yes. So confirmation and readiness. I'm not. Don't get me started on confirmation and its theology, um, but because many people think that confirmation is the child confirming their baptism, not. But don't worry about that. Um, we do still say that now you have a child who's older, you know, at least eighth grade, um, and they can certainly speak up for themselves. And um, what you'll see in these bullet points multiple times is participate. They need to be participating, participating in liturgy, participating in prayer life, participating in faith formation, all those things. They must be participating of their own free will. I mean, sometimes they might get dragged there. We all know teenagers, um, but they need to be, be willing to do this and, and have an actual desire to be confirmed. They, it can't be because grandma's paying them to do it. Um, it can't be because, you know, mom says they have to. They must individually express a desire. In fact, it's part of the individual, it's part of when we present them, we say, the children have each individually expressed a desire to receive this, the whole, um, fullness of the Holy Spirit. Um, so those sort of things is, you know, individual um, meetings with each of the kids. How are you doing? What's going on? How do you feel? 
are you ready for this? Um, you know, I MC at a lot of these events, as you all know me from those events, and um, I've had kids pull out the morning of, you know, and they say, oh, this, this child said this morning he doesn't want to do it. And I said, God, God bless him. If later on he decides to do it, we can get him in a different, um, you know, we'll get him in a different ritual or different um, parish. But good for him for, for standing up and saying, I need more time. That's okay. That We want them to learn that sacraments aren't forced upon them, but there's something that they actively and willfully want to want to do. You know, Laura, as you're speaking, I, I don't know if we've emphasized this enough, but that hold uh, readiness for the sacrament happens within the context of an interview mm -hmm. with the student and a lot of times student and parent. Um, so that there is a, a discussion happening about how is my discipleship within this parish community and within my life happening so that you can ascertain with the parents uh, their readiness for the sacrament. And nothing says, by the way, and I've seen this in best practices in some of the parishes, nothing says that you only, that the catechists interview only the faith formation people and the teacher interviews the, um, the school kids. Right. Mix it up. Why don't you interview the family, the kids and the families from the schools and the teacher might help you interview the faith formation kids. Then you're getting new experiences. They're, they're introducing themselves to you. You're kind of getting um, integrated again. And you can have other people do the interview as well. Obviously the parish priest can do the interview. You can have people help out. Um, but that is another example of mixing it up, making sure we understand this is all part of one parish, one activity, one community. And this is not the time to give them a test <laughs> To, if they pass the test, then they can be confirmed. Uh, that's not what readiness for confirmation or readiness for First Communion. It's how is one at the age and capability of this child able to demonstrate that they are living their discipleship with the Lord Jesus. And you know, it's been 40 years since we, when we stopped examining the children during the liturgy. It used to be that the bishop during the homily or right before the liturgy would actually give a quiz and would kick kids out. It's been years, but of course they're hearing it from grandma or from mom. Oh, when I was confirmed, you know, they made me, you know, say the 10, sac ten um, commandments, you know, and it freaks the kids out. But yes, this is not the time to be doing that. I think I may have heard it in the diocese too. <gasps> I hate to say that. But it may have been a rumor that was not true. Definitely. <laughs> so what happens? How does confirmation then get, get going? One is it's the pastor's role to ask the archbishop for a date for confirmation. And I think this is a pretty regular practice that most people know. You give three dates. Uh, the Archbishop sits with other people who are going to help with confirmation. They determine if they're free and you, the pastor gets sent back a date that's chosen. A parish cannot ask, I mean, a Catholic school cannot ask for a date from the Archbishop to confirm. It's the pastor's responsibility for that. Um, so, if you're wondering how does it happen and when do I ask, you can ask us, but it goes through the Archbishop's office. And as I said, it's eighth grade and older. Uh, that's determined by your parish. I know there's a lot of discussion in deaneries about what age group. There's been a lot of discussion with priests about what age and is the Archbishop going to specify a specific age. At this point, he's not. The um, the guidelines that are there or the policy that he set is still the same. And um, the celebration is a joint celebration if at the parish level, if you don't have enough students, I think it's 20? 15, I think. 15 for the Archbishop to come out. Um, Laura schedules uh, celebrations at St. Mary's Cathedral in the Easter season and you can join for that or you can make friends with your neighboring parish and join with them and I know some of our parishes do 
um, joint celebrations because they don't have enough students. And on the flip side, we have people who have too many students. We actually have a couple of parishes that if you were to combine both the faith formation and the school, they wouldn't fit in the church. Literally, the church is too small. So in order, because the pastor takes the priority of having them be a ju joint celebration seriously, they bring them to the cathedral because we can fit as many as you want in the cathedral. Um, so if you're too big and, and people are saying, oh, no, no, the reason we have to have a separate school and a separate faith formation group is they're too big. Well, no, come on over to the cathedral and we'll accommodate the whole group and all the families. Great. So let's uh, go back to the group and uh, was it Romina? And, you know, I should interrupt one thing um, oh, before we do you want to go back. No, no, you're good. Um, okay. There, I've had a lot of questions about, you know, last year the Archbishop gave a blanket delegation to all pastors to confirm um, because of COVID. He wasn't going to be able to go out to the parishes. He knew that there, some of the parishes were having, because of group sizes in counties, they were having really small, like they were going to have five confirmations because they could only accommodate a certain number of, of people. Um, that was revoked on Easter Sunday, meaning the delegation expired last Easter Sunday. People could still ask, and we had some pastors who came forward. You can always ask. There's no harm in asking. Um, but the Archbishop's pretty reluctant. He really wants to get back to either he or one of his delegates, and his delegates aren't always a, aren't always a bishop. Um, it could be Father Howell, it could be Father Summerhays, it could be a dean. Um, he's really getting back to having someone other than the pastor confirm. If you guys want to know why, we had two pastors who didn't use the right words and we had to reconfirm everyone because they were invalid. So when he sees things like that, including that it was videotaped, so we had the full tape to prove it, um, he says, yeah, let's go back to having the guys who do this, you know, professionally, the, the bishops and the deans and people doing it. So you can ask if you guys are looking at a date and you've talked to your pastor and you've talked to the, you know, the principal and the pastor and the catechists and the teacher have all gotten together and you guys have chosen a couple of dates and the bishops can't make any of those dates, you are absolutely allowed to request a delegation. I can't guarantee it will be given, but you are permitted to do so. If you do that, make sure he uses the right words. And I I know uh, Nancy from St. Gabriel said last night, I think it was last night when we were together, that uh, they're doing confirmation at their parish and F Bishop Daly is coming. Mm -hmm. Now, Bishop Daly was, you know, part of our diocese and then he got oiled and moved up in the world and he comes back but i've also heard that bishop mcelroy comes because he knows some people yeah, in the parish or something yeah. so uh that's not unusual to have happen but normally it's it still has to go through the archbishop archbishop always has to give permission for um that to happen within the diocese itself and i think Let's ask a couple of questions. Questions. And then Nancy's, I'm do RCI quickly. Nancy's raising her hand. I actually just to I have to, but just to piggyback on that, he actually has a niece and a nephew being confirmed oh. in our program. So that's there you go. Yeah. Was the invitation and um and of course the Archbishop agreed. So thank you guys for that. Um the question that I have is looking at all these um the confirmation requirements and then the RCIA or RCIC program. My, my struggle is that when they're coming in and they want to be fully initiated, um, that's generally happening in the second grade, third grade. How then do we say we put them through a program for two years, three years, I'm trying to stretch it out, but how can we say that this child in the fourth grade is an adult and saying, yes, I want to be confirmed and not doing because of the parents. How does that child get the experience of picking a confirmation name and really understanding what, you know, what it is? I, I just really struggle with that. Um, I understand that we have to do it and I'm trying my best, but what I'm seeing doing it is that the comprehension is just not the same, especially for confirmation. Um, and the responsibility that comes with that. I even invited one child who was fully initiated in the fifth grade and I'm, he's still continuing with our religious ed education program. And I've even talked to him because he's in the eighth grade this year and I'm just, and we confirm in the ninth to come back in the ninth grade to be a core team member, one of our teenagers to right. teach so he can get that full 
overnight retreat experience of doing the faith walks and the faith trust and the mass and the and, and everything that we do and the talks and and listening to the other teens. So um, my question, I guess, is can we somehow is it appropriate to say, well, look, we, we need to start that. Yes, we can do this, but maybe later on and try to push it a little further or closer to the being initiated fully in the eighth grade, or do we have to then do all sacraments at, with a fourth grader? Well, the answer, the short answer is yes, you have to do all sacraments with fourth graders. There's, again, there's a lot going on here. Um, yeah. One, as I said before, my pet peeve about what confirmation is. Confirmation is not an individual adult saying, I am confirming my baptism. It is actually the church confirming the baptism and giving you the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So as long as we always think of it as a Catholic bar mitzvah, and you know now I'm an adult. Now I can I can you know confirm my own thing. Then yeah, it's going to always be weird to have a seven year year old doing that. Um, so that's part of the theology of the sacrament. The other thing is is that you know I always tell people when you receive a sacrament, you never fully understand it. I I, I appeal to all of you who are married. On the day that you were married, did you fully understand what you were getting into when you got married? Did you understand the fullness of you know? what this entails, how this is, or were there kind of stars in your eyes and, you know, yeah, it's going to be hard, but I love this guy or love this woman. And same, I say the same thing to my priests. I say, on the day that we had laid hands on you, did you totally get what it meant to a priest? And the answer, of course, is of course not. None of us are. We have a understanding at the time of what we think it is and we are have our best intentions. But of course, we should continue to grow. We should continue to get education. We should continue to expand ourselves. Um, so that's the other thing I say is, you know, if we said to everyone, well, you can't have any sacrament until you fully understand, none of us would even get first Eucharist um, because it, it develops and grows. So that's the thing of, of kind of like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't, confirmation is not graduation from religious education and therefore everything stops once you're confirmed. Um, it's a basis, it's the church, and then we continue. And absolutely, Nancy, your ideas of, you know, having him, con having that one student you were giving an example, continuing in the actions, continuing to be with his fellow um, with the community. So he's going through these retreats and things and, and plus they're fun. I mean, these people, all the rest of the students will have the same experience and he will have been left out. That's ridiculous. So um, including to incorporate them as much as we can. Absolutely. I am conscious that we're running out of time. We're though. running out of time. I just wanted to tag on just so you know, if you have people who've already been confirmed, but in with the group, uh, there's always an opportunity for a blessing. Right. A special blessing for those people who have already been confirmed when the Archbishop comes to celebrate. And most people don't know the difference, but they'll just go up in line and they have something on their name tag and the, and the bishop knows rather than anointing them because you can't re-anoint, he gives them a blessing. And so they still get the photo, they still can participate in the ceremony, all, be, with, be in the class picture, you know, all those sort of things. That's all great. They don't need a certificate because they've already gotten it. Well, let's quickly do one more. You want me to do a jam, like, like a, a jam session on our CIA? Yeah. Let me do really quickly for you guys RCIA, just because I know that we do have lots of questions on RCIA and, and Nancy brought up some great questions. Um, yes, for anyone over the age of seven, which the Catholic Church has determined to be the age of reason, um, if they want to join the church and be um, become fully Catholic, then all three sacraments of initiation are given together. And the bishop, by the way, they do not need a delegation from the bishop. In fact, the priest is required to give them confirmation and first Eucharist. Um, the rites can be done privately when it is a child. And actually, we, by the way, there's no such thing as RCIC. It is actually RCIA adapted for children. Because again, technically, according to the Catholic Church, I know it sounds crazy, anyone over seven is an adult. Um, so we do say that, um, you know, the parents need to be in, involved in this process. They need to be bringing the child to church. They have to still be supporting them. And I, you know, I'm saying child. It could be anyone from seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, or even older, obviously, once you get into the... Um, more adult age. And to the point that we were, Nancy was just talking about and we were just discussing, later children should participate with their peers. You know, we can't delay First Eucharist, but we can certainly um, hold, you know, they can certainly then participate in their program. They can then go up. They can, if you want them to wear the little white dress or the suit or anything like that, that's the tradition and the customs of your parishes, that's fine. They get in line with everyone else. It's just not their First Eucharist. It might be their 20th Eucharist. Um, but they can go up. They don't get a certificate. They've gotten it before. Um, same thing, like Celeste was just saying, for the confirmation mass. They go up. They don't get re-anointed. 
but they get to go up and be in part of the process and part of all that development, all those service projects, all that prayer, they should still be um, actively participating. Again, because initiation is not graduation. It's not like, okay, good, I'm done with that, I can move on now. We want to always be um, fully um, incorporating them and keeping them going. And we actually have more success with those because they realize that the sacraments aren't graduation. So they want, want to continue and even pass those dreaded high school years. We, yeah. <laughs> they keep participating, which is a nice thing, obviously a goal for all of us. Okay, do we have any burning questions? Maybe we have time for one burning. We have time for one burning question. Helena is, is, is dying. I just wanted to ask, because for all of these, you said, you know, you have to have like at least two years. And I just wanted to ask, because we've had students who've like, like I have a family who's moved from Minnesota and she's been in Sunday school in Minnesota and now she's an eighth grader. And, um, you know, can she receive her confirmation this year, even though it's her first year at St. Pat's, but it's not her first, she's been in Sunday school for the last five years. Yes, she can. Okay. No problem. Well, uh, and, well, and it's that's your call. You absolutely have the discretion to kind of overrule that for extraordinary circumstances like you're talking about. Um, so absolutely, if you interview her and it's like, oh, she's got it down, we're good to go, then absolutely. If you talk to her and she was still kind of clueless, you might want to say, hmm, this is a reason to delay. But no, you have that authority. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've covered a lot today. If there are other questions, put it in the chat box. The other thing I'm going to impose on you, but if at, um, you want Laura and I to come and talk more about these issues at your uh, dinnery meetings, we'd be glad to do that. Um, we have a road show. We'd like to go out and visit people. So if that's something that would be helpful to you, um, please um, invite us. And again, we are sharing this this recording with all our principals and we're going to encourage them and also some of the, the second grade teachers and the eighth grade teachers. Um, so we're encouraging them to all hear the same message. We're all on the same page. Um, and please start those conversations if you're not already having them. Um, I'll, I'll send you a Starbucks card if you tell me you're taking them out to let, out to coffee. Um, you know, take them out, get to know them. Can I take you to the Starbucks <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. That, We'll do that after this. Um, you know, it really start building that relationship because I think all the best practices, every time that Celeste and I hear about a great practice, it's because the principal, the pastor, and the teacher, and the faith formation director, and often the liturgists are on the same page. Whenever we hear about nightmares, and that's where all my gray hair comes from, um, is when there's no communication. Um, so please reach out. Please just keep talking. And as long as we're talking, and as Celeste said, we're moving towards that ideal, we're going to be successful. And we're going to have good experiences for our children who will then want to continue on in their faith and not see these as just milestones that they need to get over and, and move on. That they will be those children of faith we started our prayer with. Yes. So thank you all for joining us this morning and uh, look forward to more conversations as we go forward. And blessings and prayers to you as we come upon Catechetical Sunday this, this week that uh, thank you for your ministry within the church and helping prepare our candidates for the sacraments. Yep. Thank you. God bless.